am so wondrously safe from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood. And you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see so many people here, and uh, hopefully there's a lot of people online. Um, uh, also, um, basically, the Nino family, both Serena and Mike, um, are recovering. They actually dialed into Sunday school this morning, so that was great news. Um, and sounds like Kerry Sinus is also recovering from COVID. So um, that's praise the Lord, um, all these people are recovering. Um, but there are more people getting COVID, and we just want to be diligent in praying for those um, that, are, that uh, are suffering through that illness. Um, also pray for Joanne Tomkowitz, who is battling a rare lung disease, and just keep praying for her, and especially uh, a hedge of protection around her that she doesn't get um, COVID. Also, um, offering envelopes are available and if you're in interested. I think most of the ones got collected back in the back. Um, but, but if somebody wants new ones, they are, there are more offering envelopes. And again, what is the purpose of offering envelopes? What you give is between you and God. Um, and, and giving is just part of our worship. We give to God as part of worship. And so the offering envelopes help you to, to do it on a weekly basis. And it's just a reminder, and it is all available also if, if you're, if you're, you know, for tax purposes. But, but again, um, it's probably a good idea to do, but it's not necessary. Um, but again, we want to praise God with our, our finances. Um, also, we're, we actually were studying Hebrews 13. We're almost a couple weeks away from being done the book of Hebrews. And um, we mentioned this in Sunday school last week, but um, we're going to be studying um, what does the Bible say about specific topics? And what I like to do is get uh, people from here and online to give me any topic that they're interested in understanding what the Word of God says. And again, it's really important for us to understand the Word of God with respect to some contemporary issues or any issue, actually, because what we decide to do is not based – if we decide based on our good – principles or what we think or what the world thinks, we're just conforming to the world. And what we need to do is think about what the Word of God says and formulate our response based on the Word of God. And, you know, there are things in the Word of God, you know, people will say, you know, there's no mention of heroin in the Word of God. Well, there's a lot of things about addiction and, 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 and substances and stuff like that that apply to things like heroin or whatever. So, um, what I'm going to do, because I know it's hard for, I, I, I kind of encourage anybody, email me, email pass with any topics, and I'll, I'll, I'll look at them and we'll try to fit them in. Um, but I know that I don't get, I haven't gotten any yet. I think I only announced this last week and it was Christmas. 
and I don't expect to get any. But what I'm planning to do this week is I'm going to make up a list that I can then say, here's a list of a whole bunch of things. What are people interested in? Okay. And so I think that might be a better way to do that. And we'll, so I'll do that next week and then I'll get some ideas and then we can look through that. But again, um, the focus is on the Word of God, just like when we study a book of the Bible, focus on the Word of God. But I know talking to my sons and some other people, there are a lot of issues that come up that people want to know, what does the Word of God say about this? What does the Word of God say about that? And it's important, I think, to do that. So we'll do that for a little season of time, and we'll see how it goes, and, and then we'll get back into another book of the Bible. But it's, it's the same thing. It's going to be just based on the Word of God. Um, let's just pray for our offering. Again, also, before I pray, um, reminder, um, people here, you can put your offering in the plates, and then the people online, um, if there's an opportunity, um, I know there's on our website, or just mail it in or whatever, um, because it's important, our offerings are part of worship, and part of our worship is to give. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be here this morning to worship you. We thank you for your love and mercy, and we lift up each person here in church and also on Zoom, I mean on uh, Facebook, Lord, and that you would put a hedge of protection about them, especially with all the illnesses going around and the sickness. And help our focus to be on you, Lord. Lord, as we um, give you a small portion of what you've given us, it's an act of faith. And it's faith because, Lord, um, what we're doing is we're willing to live with less because we know that you're the one that provides. And that part of our worship is recognizing that you are in control, that you provide, and that because of that, we can give us part of it back to you and know that you will provide, Lord. Lord, we just lift up this offering that for your glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 1. One of the blessings of um, the quarantine has been, it wasn't a blessing in the beginning to scramble to try to, to adjust and do things online. Uh, the learning curve was great, but one of the big blessings uh, has been able to, for us to be able to have people join us online 
in the last couple weeks, uh, it has been a blessing to me that a, a friend from high school named John Martin has been uh, tuning in and watching our services. So John, if you are out there now watching today, uh, it is so good to have you on, and we have been praying for you. Uh, what a blessing to see you logging in. All right, Matthew chapter 1. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 1. And we are, again, this morning, just going to focus on the Incarnation and one aspect of it. This will be a three-parter. Last Sunday morning, we focused on the Incarnation and what it literally was. Literally, the word means to be enrobed in flesh. And so God became man. Uh, and then Wednesday night was our Christmas service. And we continued the aspect of the Incarnation and the fact that when Jesus Christ became man, his glory was veiled. Almost the whole time that he was on this earth as a man, because he had been robed in flesh, he became man, uh, his glory was veiled. Other than the time on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and we talked about that. And then this morning we're going to look at one more aspect. So follow along as I read, beginning in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he beheld, or while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to gather, to gather together and, and study your word and hear it preached. And as we think of this past week and on Friday celebrating the, the incarnation, the birth of a Savior into this world, we're grateful for the, the purpose and the cause of, of uh, Christ in Christmas. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us as we once again look at the great doctrine of the Incarnation and what the ramifications are, what that means to us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to understand how these important spiritual truths are supposed to impact our daily lives, how these things make a difference. And I ask your blessing. Father, I pray uh, for those that are battling with COVID. I, I forgot to write down Judy Connor. I think of uh, the Ninos and, um, and, and Marie and Claire. I think of others, Father, that have had it. We're just so grateful for your healing power. Uh, the sinuses, we lift them up to you. I believe they are improving. And then, for, Father, I pray especially during this time, which I know is a very difficult time for those who have lost loved ones. I think of the Kerr family. I think of the Zito family. I think of the, the Falls and the Alice family. I think of the Cochiardi family. There's just so many people that have lost loved ones this year. And I pray that they would draw near to you during this time as the loss is fresh as they think back to just last December when these precious people were with us. And Father, we would ask you to bless and give extra grace to these folks. And we pray that you'd bless the word today. 
again. May it impact our lives. May it make a difference. And we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right, let's turn to him 49. Blessed be his name, him 49. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die that he might be redeemed. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, all angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of men, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And I am going to begin uh, by just going back to the verse that I read a few minutes ago. As we continue to talk, uh, Christmas being just two days ago, we want to finish up talking about the Incarnation. What an important teaching from the Bible that God became a man. And when you fully study what the Bible has to say about it, you realize the implications of the Incarnation. Uh, it should make all the difference in the world and out of the world in eternity. It should, just, it should just radically transform your life. God became a man. God is with us. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. So in Matthew chapter 1, there's several passages uh, there's a lot of passages that are very significant that teach this thing called the Incarnation. And again, the word Incarnation is limited to the doctrine referring to what happened to the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, when he became man, when he took on human flesh. And we read the story in Matthew uh, chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, verse 18, was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, and here's the key, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. There's something very unique about the conception of this child, the beginning of the, the fleshly life of Jesus, but not the beginning of the second person of the Trinity, and so this miraculous birth 
which would be from the seed of the woman, not from the seed of man, uh, because, folks, that's where we get our sin nature. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and, of course, we can blame Adam for that. Uh, we have sin natures, every one of us, including Jesus' earthly mother, Mary, had a sin nature. The incarnation only applies to Jesus Christ because he had to be born sinless, but he became flesh. John chapter 1 is one of those significant passages of Scripture that teaches the incarnation. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God entered into the human race in the person of Jesus Christ to be a part of us. Then we also think of Philippians chapter 2, which says that he was made in the likeness of men. That's what happened when God became man. And here in Matthew chapter 1, uh, the thing I want to focus on, where we get the word incarnation, it says, all this was done, which was that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, and now, now Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So one of the many names given to Jesus Christ was the word Emmanuel, and then it tells us this, which being interpreted is God with us. The message of Christmas, the message of the incarnation is that God is with us. And I want to ask you something this morning. Is God with you? This is so important. Because for centuries, the Jews looked for Emmanuel. They looked for God to be with them. And how important it is for us to realize that God came and entered into our world so that he could really have a relationship with us. Is God with you? Do you have a relationship with God? We're going to look at today this idea, the, the idea of belonging to something. Because really, we're going to look at how God wants you to belong to him. And that is only possible because of Emmanuel, God with us. God created us to be people who need relationships. He did not... In fact, the beginning, the Bible says in Genesis 2.18, when God created everything, he made this statement referring to mankind. This was before when Adam was created, the animals were created as companions, but they didn't quite meet the needs of man. And so God says, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so he created a helper, Eve, who would be the perfect fit for Adam. But that basic concept, it is not good that man should be alone, leads us to understand that we need relationships. Now, too many people look only for another human being, a companion, a soulmate. That's all they look to. They, they think that, okay, they understand, I need relationship, I need to belong, I need someone to be with. And they look for another human being only to meet the deepest needs of their souls. And I submit to you there is a relationship that is the most important relationship that can only in and of itself truly satisfy the deepest longings of all of us. And it is God with us. This past year, has been a challenge, has it not? Not just in America, but all across the world. The idea of the forced shutdown, the quarantines, as, as, as people all across the globe have taught, sought to, to you know, address this coronavirus, 
It has created hardships on people that no one ever would have even dreamed of last year this time. Never. I read a report in Japan in October, uh, a story about a lady. They were just getting ready to go, uh, just like many countries, just getting ready at this point in October to go into another lockdown. And this dear Japanese lady, she just could not bear it. And so she went to her doctor to, be, to get euthanized, to, to assist in suicide, because she could not bear another isolation. How sad. You know that in Japan, just in that month, October, more people committed suicide than died from the coronavirus the whole eight to ten months, whatever the quarantine was. More people died from suicide because they're just, people are lonely. People are lonely. And, and some people, uh, in fact, one of the earliest messages during the quarantine was, um, had to do with closed quarters. I think that was the title. Because some people found that being in closed quarters with the people that are in their life was not preferable. You know, and they really had some challenges with that. But I want to submit to you that God, first of all, God has created us to be social beings. It's not good for us to be alone. He created us to belong. And he has also created a way, in fact, the most important way, the most important thing that you and I should belong to is we should belong to God. We should have a relationship with God. Let's bow in prayer, and then we're going to jump in the scriptures and, and see this idea of belonging. And, and look at what does the Bible say about meeting this deepest need of all of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, you came to this world you intervened, became a man, so that Jesus Christ could die on the sin or die on the cross for our sins, so that we could enter into a relationship with you. Lord, I ask your blessing on the word today. Help those that are listening to be attentive, to not be distracted, that they might follow through on the biblical teaching of the incarnation and how important it is for them to belong to you. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles open, turn to uh, Ecclesiastes, right after Proverbs. you got Psalms, Proverbs, and then you have Ecclesiastes. It's not necessarily an easy book to find. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. And one of the themes, something you'll see over and over again in this book, because this was... Solomon's perspective of life with one thing removed, God. So, and, and by the way, Solomon tried everything this world had to offer to, to meet the deepest needs of himself. He tried business. He tried wealth. He tried pleasure. He tried wine, women, and song. I mean, the, the, you go through Ecclesiastes, and he tried everything, quote-unquote, under the sun. And every time, until he put in the missing equation, every time his conclusion was, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And that word vanity means it's empty. And so all the things that people look to to satisfy can't satisfy. And here's one example. When he looked to companionship, and he, he made this observation in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning of verse 8. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. In other words, he's talking about the, the fact that, you know, there's people that don't have anyone else in their life. And they're going through all the things that people do. They're working hard to make a living, but they don't have anyone to share it with. 
No, no son, no child, no brother, nobody else, no human relationship. And so even their labor is worthless. They're, they're, not, they're working for nobody. And then he picks up in verse 9, and he says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So this, the, Solomon is writing and pointing out the fact that in our human state, we were designed to be with other people, to have relationships. And, and of course, the saddest is even someone that doesn't have family will be lonely. And so human relationships are important. But I want to remind you that without the key relationship, even our, even our human relationships will not satisfy without a relationship with God. Without a relationship. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 encouraged singleness. And uh, he said, um, He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the person that's not married, or the person that is married, has to, he also has to please the things of the world, how he may please his wife, care for the things of the world. And we also realize, too, that some people will look to other human beings to meet every need. And some of those needs, folks, only God can fulfill in us. If you put God first, you will find every human, you will find the ability to have satisfaction in other human relationships. But if you do not have a relationship with God, you'll be like Solomon. You'll try a relationship with this woman and then that person and then that person. Solomon had 700, was it 700 wives and 300 concubines? Or the, the, he had a thousand women in his life. I'd say Solomon OD'd on relationship, wouldn't you? <laughs> Can you imagine that? A thousand people. Solomon was never alone. You would never, Solomon never complained of being bored. And yet, his testimony is, it's vanity because he forgot God. And only when he put God in the equation could he be satisfied with all those all those things that God has given us, many of the things Solomon talks about are things that God has given us richly, these things to enjoy. But if you don't put God first and you don't have a relationship with God, nothing will satisfy. So again, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 8, it talks about, it uses the term vanity. And vex, uh, this also is vanity, the end of verse 8. Do you know that certain people, historically, let's talk about belonging to God. Do you belong to God? And just, just I want you to think of what your answer would be to that question. Do you belong to God? Some people would say, yes, I do belong to God. But there's a lot of people that really honestly do not know how to answer that. How do you know if you belong to God? Well, I want to go back now, and, and as we look at our Old Testament, we look at the history of God's people. There were people called God's people. There were people that belonged to Him. He identified of all the nations in the world. God chose, and this is in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, where God lays out His plan, that He chose one person that He was going to bless, and that man named Abraham, his offspring, was going to be, in a unique way, his people. And so the Old Testament is a, a story 
about how God chose a nation, Peter would say a, a unique, peculiar people, an individual nation, and he would call them his own. Can you imagine the honor of being born in a nation where you are considered God's people? Well, you want to hear something tragic? In John chapter 1 and verse 11, talking about Jesus coming into the world and that, that Jewish connection because Jesus was born a Jew as a fulfillment of the Jewish Messiah. He was the Jewish Messiah. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 11, He came unto His own. Wow. And here's the tragedy. Then that verse says, And His own received Him not. How tragic. He came unto His own. What's that mean? He came for the Jews. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, and the Jews rejected him. What a tragic thing. By the way, let's talk about that for a minute, because some people have a problem with that. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that the God of heaven, the God of creation, chose one nation of all the others and just left everyone else out? You had to go, you had, only Jews would be blessed? Oh, no, wait a minute. The God of heaven, who identified himself as Jehovah, revealed himself to Abraham, Abram at the time, said he was going to bless all of Abraham's offspring. But does that mean then that God shut out the whole world? Absolutely not. In fact, let's think about the Passover, one of the celebrations of the Jews. And, uh, and in the instructions that were given when God was judging, when God was really protecting or delivering his people, who had been in slavery, he gave these instructions when he was ready to deliver the Jews. In Exodus 12, verse 48, God said, And when a stranger shall, so, shall sojourn with thee, travel with you, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land. In other words, God... Though the, and people will forever have a problem, some people, they say, well, I don't like the fact that God chose the nation of Israel to work only through them. And so I reject that kind of God. And you, you have that opportunity to do that. How tragic that would be. Because that is the, the, the people which would eventually bring the Messiah who would die not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. And even in the Old Testament, you could worship the true God, but you had to do it his way. You had to go through the people of Israel. And you had to, you had to be circumcised, but, but you would be one as it was born in the land. In other words, you'd be received by God. And so up to this day, God has given a very unique way to enter into a relationship with him, and it is through the Jewish Messiah. I'm not Jewish. I don't have any Jewish blood that I know of. German, Irish, and a little bit of something else. What is it? Scott, Scottish. German, Irish, and Scottish. No Jewish. But you know what? I worship a Jewish Messiah. And now I am one of God's chosen people, just like you can be, whether you are Jew or Gentile. You can belong. Jesus said this in John chapter 6 and verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. If you do not have a relationship with, with God, the only way to do it is through his son, Jesus Christ. He came, became, he entered into the human race, becoming a man so that he could die on the cross and pay for your sins. He was the only person, human being, born without sin because you and I 
are sinners. I love that statement. I think we saw it in the in the on a plaque. Um, Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. What an awesome truth. So, are you lonely? I've been thinking a lot every holiday now. I am blessed. Uh, I love the holidays, and um, holidays are a time other than funerals where families get together. Uh, and, and I'm so grateful. You know, my daughter traveled down. We had, we had all our family together. Unfortunately, just our immediate family. Usually we get together with our extended family, but the quarantine squished that. But I'm mindful of those who had nobody to be with on, on Christmas, on the holidays. And whenever I think of that, I'm reminded of a dear lady named Gertrude Huff, who was, you know, she was a dear lady that was a teacher, a school teacher all her life. She retired, and then when she retired, she went to a church, and I became the pastor. It was the first church I ever pastored. And so I met this dear lady named Gertrude Huff, who had lived her whole life as a single mom, or not a single mom. She didn't have kids. Single lady. And she was a teacher. Retired teacher. And you know what? She was not a complainer. She really was satisfied. And I remember I, in, initially, because I had just gotten married not long ago, and I'm loving this marriage thing, and I'm loving all the, you know, I got a best friend. I got someone I can hang out with in life. And I always, I kind of looked on her with, with some sympathy. Poor Gertrude Huff. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have a companion like I do to go through life. And I, I kind of pitied her. And I was wrong to do that because I asked her one time, you ever regret that you didn't get married? Or you, do you ever feel like you, you missed out? And she goes, oh, no. And she meant this with all her heart. She said, Pastor, when, if I ever do feel lonely, it just reminds me of how God feels when I don't walk close to him. And it, it just compelled her. She did not, she honestly did not feel like she was robbed of anything because she had a close walk with the Lord. And if she ever started feeling lonely, it just drove her closer to the Lord. What a blessing. That's what, if you have a relationship with God, Whatever rela human relationships you do or do not have, whatever the condition, the status of your human relationships, I, I know a lot of people that, are, that look at other people that are single with envy because they're so miserable in their marriages. Oh, I wish, wish I was like that person. You know, it's so funny how no matter what situation you're in, it's so easy to look at the, at the other. The grass is always greener on the other side. By the way, that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 went through all the different situations. People that are married, people that aren't married, people that are born into slavery, people that are born free, all the different things. And he said, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. In other words, wherever you're at, whatever your relationship status, whatever your economic status, whatever your people you know, it, whether you belong to this group or that group, abide with God. That's the key. No matter what your human relationships are or are not, if you don't abide with God, then you are missing the key ingredient. Some people think, I need to belong to something. And I'm missing out because I don't belong to something. You know, the Bible says, Though hand join in hand, even the wicked shall not be unpunished. In other words, some people join causes and they find their identity in other people rallying around and they all support the same thing and that really satisfies them to a degree. But God says, though hand join in hand, though you, are, you belong to a group, if you don't have God, the wicked will be punished. I remember reading... A situation, Abraham Lincoln, there was a time while I was pastoring here that I really got into the Civil War. I know, Dave, you were in the Civil War. I'm trying to think of some other people in our church that really got into the Civil War. Just studying it, America's Civil War. And boy, what a lesson. There's so many lessons in there for us. 
And it probably was around the time that Ken Burns came out with this thing on the Civil War. But I've thought a lot about Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln has gone down in history as being a very great president. But you know that in, in uh, 1865, on the night of April 14th, Abraham Lincoln was not popular. In fact, millions of people despised Abraham Lincoln. In fact, you know, we know a little bit today, we, our country concerns me right now. Because there is division in our country that those of you that are older, you, you realize this is kind of unprecedented for us. We are living in times, folks, where our country is more divided than it ever has been in our lifetime. Well, go back to the, you know, the uh, 1865, and our country was divided to the point where we slaughtered one another. There was so much division up to half a million people died in the Civil War. And Abraham Lincoln was at the helm. And he was a despised man by so many people. A very lonely man. You know that when he was assassinated, in the, on that night they found five things in Abraham Lincoln's pocket. One of them was a handkerchief. Interestingly enough, embroidered, a. Lincoln, obviously. A pen knife, a, a spectacles case, apparently it was kind of old and repaired with string, a wallet, what they called back then a purse, and it contained a $5 bill, a Confederate $5 bill, and then a couple of old, worn-out newspaper clippings. They had been read over and over again. And in those newspaper clippings were, they were some of the few positive press things, positive things that people said about Abraham Lincoln. In fact, one of them was a speech that was written by John Bright, who said Abraham Lincoln, quote unquote, is one of the greatest men of all times. That was in his pocket. Now, you know, I imagine, I can picture by candlelight in the Oval Office. Maybe Abe Lincoln is just, you know, he's, the Civil War is either looming or, or ending, and he's just feeling like he's got nobody. And I imagine he pulls out that piece of paper, and he reads it to find comfort. Because he felt so abandoned, and, and so many people had abandoned him. How about you today? Do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you, you're part of something other than yourself? I want you to turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We talked about Israel being the chosen people of God. And Jesus spoke about them when he talked about his sheep. So that was the kind of tender relationship that Jesus had with those that were his own. And look what he said in verse 11 of John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Then he goes on and talks about the fact that he's not a hireling. He actually invests himself and cares about the sheep. And then in verse 16. Or verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So Jesus talked about relationship. He said, those that are my sheep, I know them and they know me. And then he says this in verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Folks, that's a reference to us. That's a reference to the Gentiles being grafted in, that, that there would be other people that would be his sheep. And I submit to you today that what Jesus did on Calvary is so that every one of us can enter into that relationship and that God can be with you.
Is God with you? Is God, I want you to think about this. Is God with you? I mean, you know, God is with me. I mean, you, you, you realize that. That's a reality in your life. You wake up in the morning and you understand, I belong to him. You communicate with him. You do this thing called prayer because you know that God is with you. In fact, you're dependent on him. That's why you pray. You need his help because you believe God is with me. You read his word because that's how he speaks to you. Because you believe that God is with you. So is God with you? Is it a reality? Do you talk about it? Do you acknowledge it? Do other people know, hey, God is with that person? How important that is that people know that you and I, we have a relationship with God. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll close with this thought. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the redemptive work of God. How we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. Verse 5. In fact, verse <clears throat> excuse me, verse 4 according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. I want you to look at verse 6. And the focus is on his grace, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, referring to Jesus Christ. Now, here's the idea of this verse. God's grace, which is bestowed upon Jesus Christ and everything that concerns him. So, if you are a receiver of God's grace, then everything that is part of Jesus Christ and his possession you are a partaker of that. You, you are, as it says here, we are accepted in the beloved. You want to talk about the greatest thing to belong to? Belong to the family of God. Make sure you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. God with us. That was the whole purpose for Christmas. Not just that a baby might be born in a manger and there's something about that baby. That baby is God in the flesh. And he would come as the only spotless lamb of God to die on the cross for our sins. Because it is our sin that is separated between us and our God. And only as we repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, can we be sure that God is with us. Now, here's the picture. In fact, if you want to turn there, I know I said Ephesians 1, but Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 7 will be, and I promise you this, I'll mark my word, uh, this will be the last verse we look at, okay? Matthew chapter 7. You see, there's, there's a difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ. A lot of people have religion. They go to churches, different churches, different denominations. They go through religiosity. They do different services. They do, you know, like Israel in in um, Isaiah chapter 1 and Hosea where they went through and they did all the things that God required by offering sacrifices and burning incense. A lot of people do religious things. A lot of, a lot of people do things in Jesus' name and would consider themselves Christians. But someday there's going to be words spoken. And Jesus told us ahead of time. In fact, he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that calls him Lord. Not everyone that just claims to be a Christian. Not everyone will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he says this in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day. By the way, you know what that, the word many is a very important statement. It's a very important word that is contrasted with the word few. So we're not talking about just a small handful of people. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. This is actually going to happen. People will die after they've lived on this earth. And they will stand before Jesus Christ. And they will say to him, I have done many things in your name. And folks, they are not expecting what's going to come out of his mouth. It's going to be devastating. Look what it says in verse 23. And then will I profess unto them. Folks, the the most tragic, horrific, devastating four words that someone will hear. And there will be many that will hear it. I never knew you. What? But I went to church every Sunday. I never knew you. You see, there's a difference between having religion and having a relationship. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God literally is with you. And what did Jesus say? I know my sheep and are known of my sheep. So if you are not a sheep of Jesus Christ, if you've not come to the shepherd then no matter what your religion is, call it Christian. Talk about Jesus. Call him Lord. On that day, if you are not born again, washed in the blood, forget about the denomination. We're talking about entering into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have that relationship, you will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. So what was the incarnation? It is God with us. But it didn't just come so we could give mental assent to a bunch of teachings in the Bible and doctrines. Yes, I believe that. Yeah, Jesus came. He was a historical person. Uh, He claimed to be the Messiah. I believe he was the Messiah. If you've not received him as your Savior, then God is not with you. And You might belong to a million different things. You might belong to a church. You might belong to sports. You know, sport teams have a certain camaraderie. Being a part of a team gives people a sense of fulfillment, like they're part of something. But no matter, you could be a part of the 2018 Philadelphia Eagles. Aren't they the ones that won the 2018? 2017, wow, was that? You could be a part of the Philadelphia Eagles in 2017 that won the Super Bowl. But if you're not part of the family of Christ, you're not accepted in the beloved, you're not a Christian in the truest sense, then you do not really belong in the one relationship that matters. Change that. Get saved. That's the Bible term. Become a born-again Christian. That's the only way, according to Jesus. And then you don't ever need to fear Having Jesus Christ say, depart from me, I never knew you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the incarnation. Thank you for the glorious doctrine that we have just celebrated this past week, that we have looked at from your word. And Father, I know that there's more and more people that are denying the incarnation. They don't believe, not only do they, are are some not sure that you are existing, uh, but so many of them are not convinced that you entered into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. And Father, we're so thankful that that's not just a true teaching of the Bible, but that it is reality, that you uh, became man, Emmanuel, God with us. And Lord, I pray for those that are hearing my voice right now, 
Maybe they've got religion. Maybe they don't. Maybe they're even Baptists. Maybe they're even members of this church. But they are not born again. They are not. You're not with them. And it's just empty religion. And I pray that these folks would genuinely get saved. For those listening, that they would become born-again Christians. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books out. Let's all stand. And we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn 104, Joy to the World, hymn 104. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her King, let every Nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known, for as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, for as, for as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love all right we are not dismissed yet we have our patch club kids are going to come and finish oh. our service oh. with a song oh, hold to say our honey gals will come up. Ahoy, mates! It's Do you know Emmanuel, God who dwells with man?